page. And note that there's part two tomorrow uh, at 10. Um, it's on this page sheet. Um, I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Hester Eisenstein. I teach at Queen's College and the Graduate Center. And I'll uh, just um, take advantage of the moment to say I'm running a panel today at three on occupied feminism and um, contesting the unfair alliance between mainstream feminism and neoliberalism. After that moment of shameless and self emotion. So just want to tell you that Michael Kreitke has his room, so he won't be joining us. So I'm going to introduce everybody um, and they'll speak in the following order. First is Norm Levine, um, the author of five books. Norm Levine's Norm Levine, Professor Norm Levine. 1976 study the tragic deception that united the contemporary debate over the relationship between Marx and Engels. And his most recent book, Marx's Discourse of Hegel, published by the London Congress, is an analysis of the continuity and discontinuity between Marx and Hegel. So that's the one. Then Marcello, who's organized this in a whole series of panels um, at the conference on Marx and Hegel writing. Um, he teaches at the Department of Social Science at York University. I think we have a York University contingent here. <laughs> and is the editor and co author of the volumes Karl Marx's Grundrisse Foundations of the Critique of Political Economy 150 Years Later, which we can get a copy here for the price of 35 instead of 45. 35 discount price. Um, and Marx for today, around uh, 2012. <laughs> and our discussion is going to be Bertel Holman, who says about himself that he teaches politics at NYU, is a well known Marxist academic, and he authors many books and articles, and is completing a book now on Marx's crisis here. No, Marx's writing. I beg your pardon, on Marx's writing. Okay, so let me um, introduce Walter, and we can do about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, 
I think you'll be surprised how much there is, how much was in the air when uh, when Marx was growing up, what he what he inculcated from the 18th century. And uh, this is new stuff because you can go back to American historians, historians of the Enlightenment, Peter Gay, uh, Leonard Krieger, and you can read their work. And what I say here is 99% absent. Uh, from their work. So the Enlightenment as it was presented when I was, you know, reading in it, so to speak, in the 70s and 1970s and 1980s, uh, was uh, uh, very liberal. And a um, total lack of appreciation between the Enlightenment and Marx himself. So those are the uh, uh, two points of my discussion. Two, two purposes. Now, what I'm going to do in the, in, in the short time that I have I make this quick this here, is in the short time that I have here, is to pick out about 14 concepts that were prevalent, uh, 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 widely dispersed, academically accepted in the 18th century that uh, flowed into Marxism, that, that served as the uh, presupposition of, of his theory. Not completely, he, he, he had a thing, of course, but these are sort of fundamental. Um, principles. And I don't know if I'll, if I'll have enough time, but the writers, philosophers, writers that I, I will be referring to just quickly so you can under, be able to have some of the background are uh, Fichte, the uh, German philosopher, uh, Ferguson from, from the Scottish school, which I think you're all uh, familiar with, Rousseau, of course, Kant, uh, Hegel, <coughs> my boy Hegel, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then uh, a group of people that you may not be familiar with, but who really were revolutionary in old times, which I refer to as the Heidelberg School, people interested in the history of war, the history of property, Edvard Gans, who was critical to the young arts, uh, to Bolt, who was, who was the teacher, and other people that that I'll, that I'll mention. But, uh, those, uh, I don't know if I'm going to get their names, but those are in the background. Okay. First, the notion of historicity. I mean, uh, history, or what I refer to as history, is invented in the, in the 17th and 18th century. The notion that, uh, I'm not talking about the history of the universe or anything like that, but it's the history of society, history of religion, history of society, we'll talk more about this. This was an invention of the 17th and 18th century. Um, it, was, it was clearly a secular rebellion against religion, the church, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, theology, and attempt to explain man and, and human development in very different terms. All over the 18th century, and I'll, I'll talk a few more about that as we go through, clearly Marx, I mean, he doesn't, <laughs> this in the air, and Marx breathes it. So one thing that Marx does is to take the social historicity and to apply to economic systems. No one previously, well, that's not true, but he does it on a, on a more fundamental uh, scale, okay? And uh, for those who are interested in Hegel, uh, you, uh, this is what, if you read Hegel's history of philosophy, philosophy of history, philosophy of religion, aesthetics, uh, philosophy of the state, Hegel does this. All those books describe and analyze the historical development of each particular discipline, religion, theology, uh, philosophy of right, and so forth. So Marx knows all of Hegel, well, that's not true, but we can't get the details. He knows uh, the large percentage of Hegel, so he, he carries on this Hegelian uh, tradition. Another thing that's vitally important is the, uh, are the explorations of 16th, 17th, and 18th century explorations of the New World of Australia, China, uh, Africa, and so forth and so on, because they discover primitive life. And the whole study of anthropology really is an offshoot of these great explorations of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. And clearly, Marx knew about uh, anthropology. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it. The three-stage theory of, of history. Now, this is this is Adam Ferguson. This is the whole Scottish school. I think some of you, all of you, are familiar with this. And what they did in in the mid 18th century, 1760, 1770, is to take this notion of history. And this is before Marx. And many of you, I think, are familiar with some of the work of the uh, Scottish school. But they did, the historians and scholars, 
is to apply the notion of social formation. So we use so Marx is not the first, and Marx read Ferguson, by the way. And if you want to read Marx's comments on Ferguson, read the Poverty of Philosophy, mm -hmm. where he refers to Ferguson. He also uh, uh, refers to James Seward, who's another member of the Scottish School. So the whole idea of, of three, four stages of history, you go from primitivism, you go to agriculture, you go to uh, commerce, and then to industry. I, I don't think, I don't think first I guess industry. They have three, boss is the fourth. So the whole notion of a serial, stagial, a stage of element of history is there. And Marx read these people. By the way, Marx does know uh, Hegel very, very, very well. And Hegel himself mentions Ferguson and so forth and so on. So this is in the air, and Marx picks it up. Also, this, this notion of civil society, which is so crucial to Marx, the difference, I don't, I'm not going to have time to get into this. If you have any questions, it's very interesting. This whole notion of, of a civil society existing before the state, the contradiction between state and civil society. <coughs> it's in Ferguson, and also it is in Hegel. All you have to do is pick up Hegel's philosophy of right, and Hegel makes a distinction between civil society and the state. Hegel knows Ferguson, Hegel knows some of the Scots, so the idea that, and, and, and Rousseau, the, the, the idea that civil society itself had a historical evolution, I mean, every, every one of those uh, philosophers that I mentioned understood that society, not the state, society had historical uh, uh, growth, uh, development, Society, you had the primitives, you had the clans, you had you know, the, the, the primitive savages, then you had society, society became civil, okay, and then the state grows out of, out of civil society. But there is a distinction between uh, civil society and state in all these writers, and clearly that goes into, uh, that goes right into um, Marx. Ferguson's book is called an Essay on the History of Civil Society. Okay, and there, and there you have it. Okay, another, another concept all throughout the 18th century is deals with the geographical and climatological, I don't want to say um, determinism because we had a little discussion with that in the last session, but the condition that, that human history, human society, human development, human growth, human intellect is conditioned by geographical and climatological um, conditions. So therefore, when you read in, in, you know, by this, in, in Marx, the, the fact that human beings are conditioned by their social conditions or are conditioned by, by civil society, um, this is, again, this is nothing new. Two philosophers who come into, who come into mind, Hegel has this, and again, Marx knew Hegel, and also Herder is very clear about this. In fact, if you want to see a precursor to Marx, do me a favor, and well, <laughs> do me a favor, pick up Hegel's Philosophy of History, and there is a chapter, I think it's the third or fourth chapter in the Philosophy of History, which is entitled on uh, um, the, Greek, the Geographical Determinism of History, or G the Geographical um, Conditions of History, where Hegel goes through, you know, a, a, a description of human geography, globe, Mediterranean Sea, and so forth and so on, as a basis for understanding history. The Greeks were great only because they had access to the sea. Uh, blacks in, 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 in Africa uh, had, uh, were, uh, um, uh, okay, uh, could not develop because of the excess of the sun and the heat. The climate deterred, blocked, interfered with the development of Africans to, you know, to <coughs> higher levels of uh, existence. By the way, very quickly, the word race is very widely used in the 18th century, it's, but not with the same connotations as, you know, uh, race of the 19th and 20th century in the Western world. But race was very, Hegel, everybody uses race, and, and it, but it lacks, you know, some uh, of the negative qualities of, of the races of the 19th and, and 20th, uh, 20th century. Something that you'll be amazed about, because we often said of Marx genius, he was, but he also learned that the word superstructure to describe 
you know, social consciousness, intellectual development. That term, superstructure, the first time I found it, I mean, recently, I thought it was in Marx, the first person that I have found it was in Ferguson. And it's in Ferguson's essay on civil society where he talks about superstructure. It was widely understood, this is all over Hegel, you go back, that the social conditions of societies were, were formative factors, conditioning factors in their intellectual religious development. And that's, I mean, so the, uh, although they don't use, I haven't found anyone who used the term substructure, but Ferguson uses the word superstructure. And other philosophers of the 18th century, even though they may not use the actual word superstructure, also understand that human intellectual achievement is conditioned by the <coughs> geographical, sociological basis of in their uh, time. Again, you can read uh, just uh, someone that I'm most familiar with because of my own recent work. You can look at Hegel's philosophy of religion. And Hegel's philosophy of, 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 of uh, religion, religious consciousness is, uh, is determined by man's, yeah, determined by man's relation to nature. Uh, primitive uh, people, people in clans, Everybody knew clans existed. Clans was not an invention of Marx. Uh, you have to remember, when these guys got in their ships and they went around the world, they went to Africa, South America, China, Indonesia, so forth and so forth, they found clans. The explorers came back and what about clans, everyone uh, uh, picked it up. But Hegel described his entire history of philosophy based on man's relation to nature. The clans never divorced themselves from nature, and so they were pagan. So they believed in uh, gods and in, uh, <coughs> inhabited buildings and things like that. So, um, yeah, that was, that's uh, a substructure and a superstructure. The idea of, na uh, this is very important now, <coughs> the idea of national consciousness, not class consciousness, not class, national consciousness, which is a step toward class consciousness, was widely assumed in the 18th century. The idea that you had a German mentality, the idea that you had, well, Heinrich Heine, in his, in his book on the, uh, 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 philosophy, I think in Germany, I can't that title, but it's a perfect illustration of this. You have the English national consciousness, the French national consciousness, the German, and uh, Marx himself, in the early Marx, talk, picks up Heine, who he knew in Paris, and talks about national consciousness. You, you find the same thing of, uh, in uh, Herder again, whose who book is really quite, very long and very repetitive, but, uh, but also quite. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, so the question that consciousness was, was uh, influenced and shaped by national conditions or, or historical conditions was also widely widely assumed. The idea, the idea of property, the idea that primitive tribes, clans were communist. The idea of communism is an outgrowth of, oh, I know, Maybe it was probably overstatement, but widely discovered. I say was in our originate, but widely discovered and uh, diffused in the seven, out of the exploration of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Most of these people, uh, some different, but there was more, many assumed that in the conditions of the clan, communism existed. Okay, so communism was a distinct, verifiable historical stage. And if you read again the whole history of property, which is what I mean about the history of, of property, uh, if, if you read uh, uh, Ferguson, if you read Herder, of course, if Hegel talked about clans, Hegel talked, Hegel knew that there was a primitive coming. Widely, widely assumed. So the idea that of communism is, you know, and the and the um, and the development of uh, of. Uh, of, of clans and, 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 and so forth. The development of property. This is critically, critically uh, important. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, good. good. Ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> right. I have to uh, abbreviate here, but I do want to take you to really the, the, the fundamental point of what I'm talking about. The idea, well, you have communism, the idea that property was a historical stage was also widely assumed. 
okay? And if you read uh, Rousseau, uh, the, the origins of inequality, the origins of inequality for Rousseau begin when property begins, okay? So the idea that property breeds inequality was also widely held. That doesn't mean that, uh, that uh, Rousseau calls for the abolition of property. Okay, he does. He, he, he calls for the, for, for the containment of property, but not the abolition. But the idea that property and inequality go together is widely assumed. Now, for the sake of time, Marx initially is going to be a lawyer. His father wants him to be a lawyer. So he goes off the University of, of Bonn. He studies law for about a year or two. He says, no, I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be a philosopher. So he goes from Bonn to Berlin, where he begins the study of philosophy. When he's at uh, Berlin, he meets an extremely important German legal philosopher, whose name, whose name is Edvard Gans. And in 1820s and 30s, there was an enormous debate in Germany, I mean, in a particular area, about the history of property and laws regarding property. And there were two schools. One, the, what they call the German historical school, and another Gans and Hegel and Marx. The German historical school said, no, the, the, the laws of property are, are relative, have been relatively stable. It's a little bit simplification, but that's okay. The laws of property have been stable. Gans and Hegel. Now remember, Marx took two courses from Gans in 1837 when he was at Berlin, two courses. And God said, no, the laws of property have not been stable, uh, you know, uh, fixed, but are products of historical development. So not only a, is property itself a, a product of historical development, but the laws relating to property are uh, historical, or are historically um, conditioned. So the whole, done? No, oh, okay, good. So uh, so the whole property debate, okay, the whole property debate and the laws of uh, uh, the of property are in the open and the line of development goes from a philosopher named Thibaut, T-H-I-B-A-U-T, who was a teacher of Gans, Gans who helped Hegel, Marx who took two, who took two courses from Gans in uh, Berlin. So there's a, there's a line of continuity in the theory of property and laws regarding property from Thibaut, Gans, Hegel, Marx, which is fundamental. And again, if you read Marx's 1837 letter to his father, he says he doesn't, you know, he, does, he, he doesn't believe it, um, he doesn't believe the German historical school of law that property and laws regarding property are fixed. Now, Thibaut and Gans and Hegel taught together at what I refer to as the womb of Marxism. <laughs> I don't like that phrase, but so far it's so good. They taught together at the University of Heidelberg. Okay? So why is that a big deal? I had coffee, I drank beer. <laughs> why is the teaching together, why do I single that out in the, the last couple of minutes of my presentation? I single that out because Heidelberg was a center in the study of the historical analysis, out of which Hegel comes, not Marx, Marx and Latino, of, of various phenomena. Historical analysis of property, <coughs> as I just told you, Thibault and Gans. Historical analysis of law, Thibault, Gans. The historical analysis of the state, the fact that the state had different manifestations through history by a professor at Heidelberg called, I don't know his first name, F period C period Stor, S T U H R, his history of, uh, of the side of the state, and the history of mythology by um, Kreutzer, C R E U Z E R, I forget, I forget his first name, but Kreutzer, C R E U Z E R. Hegel quotes in his philosophy of uh, religion. So there you have, in these, what I say, four or five areas, 
Histor I mean, uh, professor at Heidelberg. They go come from Heidelberg, go to Berlin. Guns come from Heidelberg, go to Berlin. Guns at Marx knew he was a student. And you can read Guns' evaluation of Marx in his report card. But they, they wrote, you know, and <laughs> Marx got a grade, and the professor wrote a comment. And Gans called Marx an outstanding student, a brilliant student. And I think, I'm not too sure about Marx, but my <laughs> the guy that I don't like, Engels, knew, knew of Gans. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, because I have to uh, wrap this up, is that if you go through the various disciplines that were existent prior, I, I haven't gone through all the 18th century, but if you go through the 18th century line and then go to Heidelberg, which is critical, and see what was going on there, the condition, all Marx does, I mean, he's a genius. What Marx does is to take this notion of history and apply it to the development of socioeconomic formations or to apply it to develop or to invent a new political economy. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he, and that's exactly and these are these are some of the precedents for his own work. Thanks. Um, I won't be able. Then there are dozens of uh, 
um, rules of books may be written on this on this topic. I won't be able to reconstruct everything. I just want to say that, uh, especially after World War II, after the barbarities of uh, Nazism and fascism, this, um, there was a big attention in the philosophical matter to try to criticize this point. And uh, just one quotation to start, and we have said the famous French Marxist said that um, the assimilation of the third dividings was the decisive philosophical event of the period in France, in Europe, but especially in France. Um, two quotations from the two of the protagonists of the debate, one very well known, uh, we have to say, and another one not very well known in the Anglophone world, but a very big name, even Fletcher, second generation of Franco school. Uh, to say in the 60s, quotation from the 60s, I would also touch the 70s and the 80s if I write up. Uh, we have to say, first of all, any discussion, the book is for Marx, the collection published in uh, 1965, any discussion of Marx's early works is a political discussion. <coughs> Need we be reminded that Marx's early works were exhumed by social democrats and exploited by them to the, the detriment of Marxist Leninism. This is the location of the discussion, the young Marx. Really at stake in it is Marxist, and the terms of the discussion are whether the young Marx was already and worldly Marx. This is a to say. Even Fetcher, completely opposite position. The early writings of Marx center so strongly on the liberation of men from every form of exploitation, domination, and alienation that a Soviet reader must have understood this comment as a criticism of his own situation under Stalin domination. For this reason, then, the early writings of Marx were never published in a large cheap edition in Russian, but also in all the socialist work. They were considered to be relatively insignificant work, works by the young Hegel and Marx, who had not yet developed Marxism. Um, this is the history of the context, as I told you, at the time, I just selected a few um, quotations. The story of this debate is divided into three main, in my opinion, um, schools of thought, three main interpretations, three groups. The first group, the people who counterposing the early writings, or the, especially the APM to capital, and stress the theoretical preeminence of on the second group is the scholars or uh, political leaders um, who paid or gave little significance to the early writings. And the third group is the group of the theoretical continuum between early writings and capital. I'll start very quickly with group one and two, and then I would like to concentrate the final second part of my paper on group three. The first interpretation, um, uh, not only the uh, APM were, uh, has been, have been considered um, uh, the most valuable text of Marx, but authors stress very much, this kind of author stress very much that they sharply differentiated from Marx's later work. This kind of interpretation marginalized completely capital, and in my opinion, after uh, having done some research on this, many of this author read a very, very insignificant part of Marx. So just to start to be a little bit provocative, which is one of my goals, I only have one goal, we have two, I just want to be provocative. <laughs> they read the 20 pages from the EPM on alienated labor and they thought that this was Marx, instead of using um, um, the blood uh, sometimes uh, on capital and his uh, preparatory manuscript. The idea is a sort of reading Marx with an ethical humanist doctrine, and of course it's understandable against the religious orthodoxy of Soviet Marxist, the thirties. But let me stay on quotation, because I really want to try to um, reconstruct this as much as I can. The originators of this interpretation were Lanzut and Meyer the two German social democrats who edited in 1932 the first edition of Marx and Writings, few weeks after Mega in Russia, 1932, two different editions, a chaos, I cannot go into this. But they wrote, Lanzut and Meyer, in the preface to this edition, which is still uh, in the bookstores, if you go to, to, to Germany, to Berlin, 
they wrote that the EPM, they wrote in essence already they, uh, the EPM anticipated capital, and I'm quoting, there was no fundamentally idea, uh, uh, new idea after the economic or philosophical manuscript. Um, also, this text was actually, quote, Marx's central work. It formed the crux of the development of his thought, deriving the principles of economic analysis directly from the idea of the true reality of man. Um, another famous Marxist, the Belgian, Henri de Marie, um, also uh, one of the originators of this uh, interpretation, he believed that there were two Marxists. So this first position agree with the second position. There are two Marx. There are two Marx. The first one, the humanist of Marx youth, and then the second one, the later Marx. And he said, and Riedemann wrote that the greatest achievement was done by the first. He was superior to the second. The second has a decline in its creative capacities. Um, who were the main sponsors of this interpretation after World War II? In this context, I like, you know the. the um, interest for the, the, the essence of uh, human beings, etc. Heterodox Marxists, as I told you, some, uh, sometimes uh, German social democracy against the uh, Soviet Union. Progressive Christians, please let me read a couple of quotations. Paul uh, will remember this French authors, the theological Marx, because at some point the philosophical Marx became a theological Marx. I'm thinking particularly to Bigot and Calvet, to uh, Calvet, to uh, Jesuit Christians. Vigo wrote, Marx is not an economist, he made no contribution to political economy. I only have nearly the time, but if I could, <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, <laughs> Calde, although, although Marx did not publish the work that they call EPM, he had already acquired, he had already acquired the basic principle, the basic principle that he would develop in the later works. And then there were existentialist philosophers, Merleau-Ponty, Marx thought, you know, was an, um, an existentialist thought, here, pocket room, um, uh, Costas Axelos, maybe is a famous author here. All of the works by Marx and Marxists, of all the works by Marx and Marxists, the 1844 APM remains the one with the densest thought. A from the United States, Marx's main philosophical work are the APM. Um, the concept of alienation was and remained the focal point in thinking the young Marx. Um, who brought the EPM and the old Marx who brought the <coughs> I believe that this interpretation is unacceptable and uh, uh, eventually I would reply to question, but I am completely against this interpretation uh, and I want to use a couple of quotations from a French liberal, uh, non-Marxist reader of Marx, also maybe to convince my young colleague Jordi that sometimes non-Marxists can read Marx better than many Marxists. Uh, um, uh, Raymond Aron wrote uh, this book, Imaginary Marxism, 1959, uh, against the thinkers who believe that APM were the center of gravity of Marxism. And, you know, the Jesuit priests, Paris and Par Marxists, um, people who <coughs> subordinated capital to his youthful writings, particularly the APM, whose obscurity, incompleteness, and sometimes contradictory character were a source of fascination for readers instructed by Alexandre Projet or uh, Per Tessal. He also wrote, if Marx had not had the hope and intention to ground the coming communists with scientific rigor, he would not have needed to work for 30 years of capital, still without finishing, a few weeks and few pages have been enough. There is much more, I don't have time. So I am against this first, first, first interpretation. I am also against the second one. There are no to say in this year. Last year we had a couple, and uh, uh, I, will, uh, I don't know if there are in the audience, I would love to say more about it. But the second interpretation started a few weeks after the first one, the originator of the jo German Social Democrats. The, first, the second interpretation started in Russia, started with the other Aski, started with the Meta edition, started with the preface to the first publication of the early writings, um, preface in which Alvarovsky said the EPM are an analysis of money, wages, the interest of capital and ground rent. No, not even one word on, on alienation. And of course there was no mention of dictatorship of proletariat in the EPM and uh, they were excluded, I told you from edition of presentation of communist parties, Marxist leftists. I don't have to spend too much time on this. I'm 
against this interpretation as well. But this interpretation became stronger when uh, Louis Althusser um, uh, shared this uh, uh, idea that this was a, only a transitional text with no special significance, alienation was not important, etc., 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 you know about this. So the beginning of my presentation maybe it was a provocation against this uh, um, early writings, but I've always been, I, I never agreed with, uh, with Althusser. I've tried to read Althusser in many parts of my life, many books. I, I, I never found what he uh, wrote um, um, uh, serious uh, of, of, on, on Marx. But if you know, the, this book for Marx was uh, the most widely discussed text in this period. I believe that there is much more uh, before Althusser his interpretation in Pierre Nadine, a, a, a very a, a, a great mind. Uh, I, 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 I don't share anything with this interpretation, but he wrote many, many books, not translated into English, Le, Le Nouveau Leviathan. Uh, Nadine wrote before Althusser about the uh, change from philosophy to science, so that alienation was consigned to the Museum of Philosophy. So you know about what you say, you know about the epistemological break, quoting that divides Marx thought in two long essential periods, the ideological before 1845 and the scientific one. And that's the cardinal point of the Althusserian school. We cannot say absolutely that Marx youth is part of Marxism. Uh, Althusser maintained this position. Both um, Levin and Holman are against, so I don't have to say, I don't think I have to say, spend too much time on this. But also later, in the reply to John Lewis, also in a certain self criticism, he maintained this position. He wrote, No doubt there was a break. Marx says so himself. The world work showed this uh, break. And um, it is true that Marx several times used the term alienation, but all that disappears in Marx later text and in Lenin completely. So Marx never wrote that there was a break, there is no mention of this, not even in, in, in dreams or nightmare. And you know, I don't see any scientific argumentation to, to invoke the fact that Lenin didn't mention alienation. Lenin and Marx and Engels were two different human beings. Now I'm more going to be on pen, imagine Marx and Lenin. <coughs> so the point for me, again, what you said is not to um, deny that Marx thought underwent huge changes and you know this maturation with the critique of political economy, but to contest our to theorization of rigid break according to which the EPM and the early writings are extraneous to Marxism rather than an integral part of Marxism. I wanted to say more, I don't have the time. What is important for me at the moment is to show you that in my opinion these two interpretations, the first and the second, so the dissident or revisionist Marxist and the orthodox communist and Althusserian school both um, uh, um, uh, created, <coughs> or consistently created, this myth of the young Marx, which for me is the principal misunderstanding in the history of the Marx portion of the research of Marx. And one of my proposals in this panel is to never again mention the young Marx, at least in this uh, 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 way. The third interpretation is my party. I am a member of um, the um, scholars and interpretation who believe in a substantive continuity in Marx's work. There is a difference in the first one. The first one is EPM is better than capital. Here there is a, a substantive uh, continuity. continuity. Uh, Lukas, Marcuse in Germany, Polito, Rubel in France. Uh, uh, English work, there are so many people here. So I'll try to focus um, the final part of the paper on the critique of my part. Because I was very happy to read all these books when I was an uh, undergraduate student uh, against this epistemological break, against this idea, but recently, in the last years, I became very suspicious of at least 80% of the comrades of my party, the party of the continuity. Uh, one meet for me was, and still is, Maximilien Rudel, maybe one of the, one of the two, three best Marxologists um, of the century. I don't know if Bertel is going to destroy Rudel later. But I wanted to say that when he published the book Essay de Biographie Intellectuelle in 1957, he shared this idea, which is for me now, today, radically wrong. Quoting, 
the category of alienated labor in the EPM was the key of all the subsequent work of Marx, the economist, and sociologist. And it anticipated the central thesis of capital. Uh, Rubel saw, quoting once again, an evident basic identity between Marx's position in his first critique of private property and in his later analysis of the capitalist economy. I believe this is radically wrong. I will concentrate the attention on the Anglophone world. Robert Tucker, Philosophy and Meat in Karl Marx, 61. A continuity of Marx's thought from the early writings to capital and the centrality of the alienation team too. As I told you, I was happy, excited. I put uh, the pictures of all this person on the wall when I was an undergraduate student. Now, suspicious. I'm suspicious. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you keep reading Tucker and, and he says, the explicit philosophy of alienation, but your teacher is almost there, it's always there, so you don't have to worry. The explicit philosophy of alienation presented in the early writings was Marx's final contribution to the subject. Capital was the logic, fruition of all his thought from the beginning. No, I'm no longer with you. Ma uh, David McLellan. Marx before Marx's 1970, all this book were uh, famous and circulated a lot. During the summer of 1844, Marx began to compose a critique of political economy that was in effect the first of several drafts preceding capital in 1867. Marx had no idea about this drive in capital in 1867. This is false. The first draft is the Grundrisse, but actually the Grundrisse is the draft of the critique of the contribution to the critique of political economy in 1859. And McClellan continued, the early writings contain all the subsequent theme of Marx's thought and show them in the making. I believe that this interpretation gave a lot of power to the Althusserian school because they were wrong. They exaggerated this. Bertel published Alienation in 1971, the book that we all dream to publish. 71, 35 copies, more than 35 copies sold, uh, translation all over the world. This book really uh, were essential in the dissemination of Marxism and the reception of, uh, of Marx. Um, and Bertel wrote, I do not emphasize alteration in Marx thinking because I do not see many there, especially when compared to the essential unit in Marxism from 1844 on. Even in the published version of Capital, there is much more of Marx's earlier ideas and concepts that is generally recognized. I believe that in our school today, in our part today, we are very weak, few, few people here and there, unfortunately, but now we should emphasize more this alteration. For example, I heard you saying, 40, uh, one hour and 12 minutes ago, that Engels in 1843, and I'm quoting textually here, and we have the record of what you said, <laughs> uh, the article written by Engels was a large part, a large part of what Marx, of what became Marxist economic theory. I do not agree with you. And, I, uh, and uh, um, uh, also Norman, sometimes also George Comey, uh, I believe that there is also a generational problem now. Because you were struggling against the Althusserian, you were struggling against, and or, for example, and you had to concentrate, you know, to, you have to say more, you have to do more. Or sometimes there are philosophers like Norman. Norman said, I don't know the uh, uh, later remarks, as I know, if I may, uh, Norman, the, uh, the, 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 the early writings. If Van Mezzaros, another very famous book, Marx's Theories of Alienation, the rejection. Um, Marx versus the major Marx, this is what uh, he wrote, does not mean the denial of intellectual development. And this is fine. But look now. The EPM adequately anticipated the later Marx, so that the concept of transcendence of Fabung, of labor's self-alienation, provides the essential link with the totality of Marx's work, including the last work of the so-called major Marx. More, he wrote with the elaboration of the concept of EPM, Marx's system is Saturn Ascend is virtually brought to his accomplishment. Marx was 26 years old. He started to read political economy few months before the writing of this uncompleted note that he left in uh, um, his kitchen. Uh, 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 
this radical idea, this is Mezzaros, concerning the world of alienation and the condition of its supersession are now coherently synthesized, coherently synthesized within the general outlines of a monumental comprehensive vision. There is no uh, uh, this in the APN for me. All further concentration and modification of my conception are realized on the conceptual basis of the great philosophical achievement so clearly in evidence in the EPN. I think it's clear what I'm trying to say and I stop bothering you with this. But maybe I want to say something about Adam Schaff, the most famous uh, interpreter of this school of thought in the socialist thought. He wrote an embryo even of the concept of commodity fetishism is to find in the EPN. Final conclusion, final conclusion. The idea of an essential continuum of uh, Marxian um, uh, writings as opposed to a sharp theoretical break that completely discarded all that came before. So I believe that this part, in this interpretation, there were some of the best interpretations of the early writings. But also a number of uh, mistakes, errors, especially because there was a huge underestimation or not, uh, they, they did not know the marked huge advances of the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s in political economy and in political theory. Um, uh, this went together with a diffuse tendency to reconstruct Marx thought through collection of quotation. If you look at the textbooks still published now, also new collection of Marx, they take 1844, 1867, 1844, they just mount this different collection because they like this without any uh, um, historical differentiation about the concept. I believe this is inacceptable for serious scholarship. And, you know, they put together this sort of author assembled out of pieces corresponding to interpreter's particular vision, uh, a sort of timeless uh, organization of Marx. Second point of my conclusion is underlying the importance of the EPM, uh, maybe I would say more in the uh, um, reply, um, for an understanding of the development of Marx, cannot, not should not, cannot involve drawing a veil of silence over the huge limbs of Marx's beautiful text. The EPM, just the first approximation, scarcely assimilates the concept of uh, uh, political economy. So I want to go two examples about this limit. The first one is about alienation. If you open this book, there is a lot about self-alienation, self-perspective. If you look at, take at this book, alienation in Marx is mostly the EPM of 1844. Um, so that they shared a lot was also the French existentialist did. I don't believe that alienation is merely this, or surely not the final word of Marx, but if you look at the alienation in the Green Greece, and not only there, this concept is enriched by a greater understanding of economic categories and by more rigorous and social analysis. But even more, the idea of communism, we still read too much the APM of 44. I did my dissertation on this, I love this text, I'm against of to say, but I'm concentrating in the critique of my comrades of my party. So take, for example, this definition of post capitalist society. Communism is the positive expression of the abolition of private property and it first appears as universal private property. Or take this other obscure philosophical definition, merely philosophical. Communism is the act of positing as the negation of the negation and is therefore a real space necessary for the next period of historical movement in the emancipation and recovery of mankind. Communism is the necessary form and the dynamic principle of the immediate future, but communism is not as much as the goal of human development form of the human society. It's not that I don't understand, I haven't studied the Vestigalian or philosophy, but <coughs> communism, this idea of post capitalist society, is something that you can find and you have to spend months of hard work in the conception of associate mode of production. You take capital, you take the manuscript of capital, you take the late political writing, uh, which are very different from this kind of fishing in the afternoon, uh, criticized after dinner, which, by the way, today we know on the basis of new philosoph philological acquisition that Marx wrote against Hegel for uh, having fun of this, uh, the, I, don't, I, I cannot enter into this, but this Fourierism of Hegel. So, uh, and, really the end, 
the EPM of 44, early risings in general, they are only an initial stage in Mars' critical trajectory. This is my proposal for my co-panelists and to the audience as well of interpretation. Had Mars not continued his research, I don't know what happened. If he just uh, you know, left this uh, paper, maybe they would have even published. Uh, in my idea, he would probably have found a place with Bauer, with Feuerbach, in the uh, section of philosophy manual dedicated to the, to the left again. That's uh, the uh, um, um, final provocation. And uh, um, instead, we should consider decades of political activity and interrupt study of and critical works of hundreds of volumes of political economy, history, and other disciplines, only this turned this young scholar who was only 26 years ago into the most brilliant mind of humanity, or as Norman Levin said, uh, into a genius. Many thanks for your attention. of a new concept or something that was dealt with 
with, uh, with a different concept in, in an earlier work. Now, the problem that I see with this is that not every difference that one finds, and maybe even not most of the differences one finds between, let's say, the 1844 the, between the 1844 manuscripts and the writings throughout the rest of the time, maybe not most of the difference represent changes of mind. Uh, so the question is, what else can account for these differences? Uh, and I'm going to suggest several things which can, I think, account do account for these differences, which are not changes of mind, and therefore changes in Marx's understanding of his main subject of his capitalism. But before I do that, let me say an important, uh, I hope, uh, an important word on the systemic character of Marxian enterprise, because I think it's this which is being undervalued in the work of most Marxologists. Marx is main subject after all. His agreement is capitalism. But capitalism understood in a way that includes how it evolved, and capitalism understood in a way which includes its potential for becoming something other in the future. Now, this system of capitalism consists of uh, innumerable interrelated processes which are affecting each other in a variety of ways. Uh, and these uh, processes can need to be understood in terms of those interactions and, and need to be understood uh, in terms of the patterns which some of those interactions come together to compose and need to be understood in terms of the totality of capitalism overall, of which they are uh, the, the essential parts. And this all needs to be understood in terms of how, how all of this has evolved from wherever it began to various stages up to the present and where it seems to be heading. Now, I want to suggest now what we must think about and try to answer about what these differences which appear in the writings of different years along Marxism life uh, other than uh, changes uh, of the kind that uh, most Marxologists uh, speak about when they talk about uh, well, even as Marcelo did who belongs to uh, a school that was supposed to also be known to but probably do. Uh, and I want to suggest that there going too far, too fast, without having tried to get a hold of what analyzing a system of the kind I've just characterized dialectically, because what makes the capitalist system different in terms of Marx's approach to it, which is a dialectical approach, is that he finds the main explanation for the changes which occur within this system overall from its beginnings to the present or where it's going, he finds the main explanation within the system itself in a certain character of some of the relations which he refers to as contradictions, which are his main explanation about how changes occur within the system and bring the system as a whole through various stages it's gone through and will continue to do so in terms of where it it, it is heavy. Could you pass me my water? Sorry. So let me suggest now uh, what are the other possibilities besides treating all of these differences as changes. First of all, I think there's an important difference which we talked about, but I don't think we think seriously enough of what, uh, what those differences could be when this division appears. And it's the division between unpublished and published works. And, uh, and this connects up with something I want to go into a little detail in a few moments, and that is the different moments in Marx's dialectical method. But one of the main expressions of this 
is his doing works of a kind that most of us don't do but maybe should, which is works directed towards self clarification based upon his research before he sets about putting this self clarification he's achieved for himself uh, into a form uh, suitable for his target audiences, plural. And the two main works directed to our self clarification, the early of 1884.